Well, good morning, and welcome to the September the 10th, 2019 Historic Site Preservation Board meeting. May we have a roll call, please? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Member Rosenauer? Here. Member Nelson? Uh, Member Huff? Present. Member Kaiser? Here. Member Dixon? Present. Member Lavoie? Here. And Chair Burkett? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Board, we heard a couple of new members. Uh, actually, Flynn just mentioned them, but I also would like to do a personal welcome on behalf of the board. Uh, welcome um, back um, Dan Kaiser on the board, and welcome aboard to both Jade Nelson and to Eric Rosenau. So we really look forward to working with you. Uh, you can see we're, we're starting you off with a very busy season with uh, just a few things that we're covering today. So. Um, May we have a report on the posting of the, uh, of the agenda, please? Mr. Chair, the agenda was posted on Thursday, September the 5th. This meeting has been noticed and posted in accordance with state law. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, does the board have any revisions to the agenda? Seeing none, may I have a motion to accept the agenda? Move to approve. Second. We have a first uh, by Linda Dixon and a second by Dan Kais by Jade. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries seven to zero. Public comment. Um, we'll now move on to public comment. Uh, this time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Site Preservation Board on agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the, Oist <clears throat> the Historic Site Preservation Board values your comments, pursuant to the Brown Act, generally we cannot take any action on items not listed on the posting, uh, on the posted agenda. There will be three minutes uh, assigned per each speaker. Testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of that hearing. And there are three public hearings today. So do we have anyone wishing to address the board uh, today on non-public hearing items. <clears throat> so please uh, sign, in, sign in if you would. And so, okay, thank you very much. State your name and your address. Hello, good morning. My name is Stephen Keelan. I'm vice president of the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation and author of the O'Donnell Golf Club nomination, which I think that you've all received. I have a letter from Gary Johns, the president of PSPF, which I'd like to read. On August 30th, 2019, the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation submitted the Class One Resource nomination for Thomas A. O'Donnell's Desert Golf Course. Yesterday, we received the agenda for the city's September Historic Site Preservation Board meeting, including a city staff memorandum regarding the Desert Golf Course nomination. After reviewing the staff memorandum, PSPF, the applicant of record, strongly objects to the highly irregular decision to process our nomination in two phases. The nomination is a PSPF product intended to make the argument that the entire so <coughs> excuse me, site is worthy of designation, including multiple structures, landscape architecture, and the historic golf course. To deconstruct the nomination gives appointed decision makers an incomplete and arguably misleading analysis of the importance of this historical treasure. As a practical matter, the proposed two-phase process not only dilutes the historical nomination, but subjects it to the vagaries and uncertainties of the city's bureaucratic process twice. The memorandum offers no valid rationale as to why this two-step process is being proposed. We note the inspiring words found on your welcome letter to the city's planning services department to wit, quote, it is our duty to promptly present well and thoroughly analyze cases to appointed decision makers. The applicants deserve a complete assessment of their proposals, end quote, emphasis added. We could not have framed your obligation to us, the applicant, any better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keelan. Is there anyone else wishing to address the board today. Good morning. If you will uh, state your name and your address, please. Yes. And Certainly. Good morning, board. Uh, I am Eric Chio. I live on Marion Way in Palm Springs. 
and I am here today representing 1PS, Organized Neighborhoods of Palm Springs, uh, which is a 501c4 nonprofit public benefit corporation that's made up of the leadership of 47 organized neighborhoods in Palm Springs. I'm also the communications officer for 1PS, and in that capacity, I'm the creative director and author of the publication I just distributed, uh, the 1PS Guide to Palm Springs Neighborhoods. This guide is the flagship publication of 1PS because at its core are profiles of 47 of the neighbor of the city's neighborhoods constituting about 90% of the of the city uh, it chronicles it, their history their culture their architecture their historic sites uh, their destinations and their curiosities and uh, now in its recently released third edition this guide is uh, gradually evolving to become a city magazine that's specific to Palm Springs it now features a spread that addresses our neighborhood parks and future editions are planned to have similar spreads uh, addressing things like uh, public art and historic sites um, it's a great overview and a great introduction to our cultural history. So I invite you to review this new edition, and if you agree that it can be useful in furthering the, the mission of this board, uh, then please... I ask that, that you keep it visible, that you refer people to it, and if you would like to make it available to other individuals or organizations that you f uh, affiliate with, I can make copies available to you at no cost uh, and, and, uh, and do presentations to those groups as well. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the magazine. Thank you. I have yes. a question. Yes, Where is this distributed? Is it the, just to community members, or is it in some of the hotels or restaurants? It's not. Our primary target, target uh, is locals, and so it, it won't be found in most of the hotels. Uh, about one, our press run is 10,000 copies. About one-third of them are distributed by 1PS reps to their various neighborhoods. The other two-thirds are distributed at uh, specific events, like the 1PS annual picnic and expo, uh, pride events, uh, Black History Parade, and, and, and other city events. And we have just received uh, permission from the city manager to have them placed in city locations, uh, including the public library, um, the um, animal shelter, uh, the, uh, uh, the city yard, and, and other locations. So they'll be, and in City Hall, of course. So they'll be all over the place shortly. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Thank Eric. you. This is an amazing project that you've uh, taken it's, on. It's a joy to work on. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. So do we have any other speakers today that would like to address the board? Yes. Please come forth and state your name, please, and your address. My name is Tom Jakeway, and I am a board member of the O'Donnell Golf Course Golf Club. And I'd like to read a, a, a letter into the record that was written by our president of our board, Rich Colbert. Um, we are writing in reference to the nomination of Thomas A. O'Donnell's Desert Golf Course as a Class I historical resource, submitted, submitted on October 30th, 2019, by the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation. The Board of Directors and members of the O'Donnell Golf Course strongly endorse this nomination. When the PSPF submitted the nomination, it was with the express intention of including the entire site, the golf course, and all structures on the property. It has come to our attention that the city is considering the pr processing of the nomination in two phases. We strongly object to this manner of proceeding as it promotes an incomplete, inaccurate, and potentially ambiguous analysis of the nomination. As a reminder, the O'Donnell Golf Course, built in 1927, is the oldest golf course in the Coachella Valley and has been a prominent fixture of our desert community for all of its nearly 100 years of existence. The design of the golf course reflects the natural beauty of its unique environment, nestled as it is against the San Jacinto Mountains, which forms a backdrop of incomparable beauty 
accented with rocks and natural desert scape in foothills that envelop the western side of the golf course. In addition to the expansive views, the entire course blends in seamlessly with its natural setting, providing an ideal habitat for both the flora and fauna of the desert. Sincerely, Rich Colbert. Um, I would also like to make some comments. It, the golf course is what brought all of this together. These buildings wouldn't be here if the golf course hadn't been built. And the golf course was built at least 10 years before the golf house was built. They act as a unit. To pull them into pieces doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, also, it, it, it provides a beautiful piece of open space against the mountain. We even last season had uh, bighorn sheep on the golf course, and I don't think bighorn sheep have been in the city of limits of Palm Springs other than far up in the canyons in years and years. So it's a really significant port. The other thing is we have lost so many of the original developments and clubs that created Palm Springs, the Desert Inn, the Ranch Club, Deepwell Ranch, the El Mirador Hotel and Golf Course, O'Donnell and Smoke Tree are about the only two pieces of the historical development that are left. O'Donnell is the only one I think that we can really fight as a city to keep together. Smoke Tree is a beautiful setting, but they've got their own control. But I think as a city, you can protect this resource for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Any other comments from public? Please come forward and state your name, please, and your address. You have three minutes. Hi there, Chris Bale, a uh, realtor and preservationist, uh, Pally Drive in Palm Springs. Uh, I'm here today regarding 2821 Livemore in the Sunmore neighborhood, which is item 5A. Mm -hmm. um, it's just being received as a nomination today, but uh, that nomination has been a labor of love that started with my former client who owned the house and was selling it and we wanted to make sure that someone purchased it who would continue along with hopefully getting a class one designation. Um, the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation, the Marshalls and Susan Sequoia Jensen, who's here, wrote the nomination. Um, and uh, we're glad to see it added to the agenda. And I look forward to whenever the public hearing happens, uh, coming back with the current owner, Catherine Bodziner, who could not be here today, but she sends her regards. And um, I just wanted to state that. Thanks. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to come before the board today? Seeing no further speakers, <clears throat> we'll um, move to the consent calendar um, and close the public hearing, uh, public comment. Um, item 1A, approval of the minutes, July 9th, 2019, HSPV meeting. <clears throat> Board does any <clears throat> one have changes to the minutes of July 9th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to accept the minutes as presented? Move I'll to approve as presented. Have second. a second. So we have a first by uh, Ms. Dixon and a second by Ms. Huff. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. All in favor? Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. So uh, next item on our agenda is number two, the election of officers. And I will turn this part of the meeting over to Mr. Fagg for the election. Uh, members of the board, with the change in the composition of the board, uh, we said goodbye, sadly, to Mr. Hayes, who served as vice chair, and Mr. Marsh. But we also welcome, at this point in time, Mr. Nelson and Mr. Rosenau, and appreciate you serving on the HSPB. Uh, it comes time to go ahead through our annual process of electing a chair and vice chair. With that, I will go ahead and now accept nominations for the position of chair. Do we have any nominations? <laughs> I would like to um, nominate Dick Burkett for chair. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion passes. Uh, next, for the position of vice chair, may I have a nomination, please? Mr. Chair, 
I would nominate Catherine Huff as vice chair. I'll second. Okay, the motion has been nominated and second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Member Huff, this is your last chance. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no objections, the motion passes. So we welcome Mr. Burkett as the chair and Ms. Huff as the vice chair. And your terms will be through June 30th of 2020. So thank you to both. Uh, and again, we thank Mr. Hayes and Mr. Marsh for their service. And thank you, board, <clears throat> for your, your, your support and nomination. I greatly appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so now it's time for public hearings. So, and we have three today. Um, so let's proceed to item, uh, agenda item number three, which is 3A, and an application by Tracy Conrad and Paul Marud, owners requesting class one historic resource designation of 468 West Taquitz Canyon Way, the Roland Bishop residence. May I have a staff report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Glenn Malacker. I'm associate planner here at the planning department. Ken Lyon is on uh, vacation, so I'll try to uh, do my best to follow his staff report and, and present it to you as best as I can. So the property that we're looking at now is, um, I'm sorry, this isn't the right one. Maybe we're starting off on a bad foot already. <laughs> Wouldn't be good. When I need to go get the other. It didn't copy over right. Can I run and get my flash drive real quick? Uh, Mr. Chair, if we could just take a recess for five minutes while we reload sure. the PowerPoint presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Recess, Grant.
Merci. Okay, so we'll um, we'll reopen the meeting, and, and would you please uh, proceed? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry for the delay. So the property that we're looking at today is 468 West Tonkowitz Canyon Way, the Roland Bishop residence. Um, so the residence, if you look at the uh, picture that's before you, uh, it sits at the base of the San Jacinto Mountains at the end of Tonkowitz uh, Way, and you'll see it's uh, Spanish style with clay tile roofs, uh, stucco with uh, very distinctive rock walls that are, are currently around it. So the Bishop House was built uh, as a, at the same time as the Mead residence, which is adjacent and the, which is a class one historic site called the Willows. So the Bishop residence is on the left and the Willows is on the right. So in findings of uh, looking at the, the report that's before you uh, in the in your packet, there are uh, standards that are used to evaluate uh, uh, can HSPB make the findings uh, to designate this as a class one site. Uh, and there are certain criteria that are used and I'll go through some of those uh, with you. So criteria number two is that has a person of significance resided at the property and Roland Bishop who was um, uh, a industrialist uh, who had moved to Palm Springs and was uh, 1930s, uh, he worked for the firm uh, Nabisco uh, and was, uh, did confectionery and baked goods uh, on the West Coast and was a worldwide uh, distributor in, of these uh, candies. Uh, and his longtime friend, William Need, was also an important figure in Southern California society and they were both successful businessmen and chose Palm Springs as their winter home. In criteria number three, Three, the Bishop and the Mead residences were built uh, around approximately the same time. They have the same sort of style uh, and they do have significance. In criteria number four, the style of the house, uh, the di distinctive characteristics of the time period and method of construction, uh, the, the residents are simple wood structures uh, and they are in, built in a Spanish and Mediterranean revival style which was popular throughout California. Uh, similar properties that are in this style were the Desert Inn, the O'Donnell House, uh, and I mentioned the Mead House and El Mirador Hotel. Uh, as more substantial buildings began to build, be built around the small village of Palm Springs, uh, it was transformed into a sophisticated resort town. Uh, in criteria number five, the architect uh, William Dodd and engineer William Richards developed a reputation of being skillful architects in Southern California and both the, Mead and, both the Bishop and Mead residences were uh, integrated into the steep hillside parcels uh, with minimal disturbance to the national topography. Criteria number six uh, and number seven were also met uh, for this style of house. So moving on, there are um, seven aspects that the National Register of Historic Places look at whenever you determine if a property is a class one status. And that includes location design, setting materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So when we evaluate this property, we look at um, the location of the site. Uh, it's original, it has not been altered, it's been in this location since the 1920s. Uh, the design, the home is integrated, uh, the intricacy, of the house. Uh, there was uh, a fire that occurred at the property in the 1980s. Uh, there have been some unsympathetic alterations throughout the decades. However, a careful two-year restoration carried out by the current owner uh, strengthens and the home's design and integrity. And looking at the setting, the Bishop residence is a large, luxurious, custom-built home on the rocky, steep slopes of the lot, and it's mostly intact. Uh, the noteworthy features include uh, how the Mead and the Bishop houses are connected together. Uh, the, the friendship between the two families was very strong. Uh, although they're walled off and separated from one another, the two home sites uh, are, have common grounds and terraces. In materials, uh, the, the residence was constructed of uh, conventional frame and stucco construction. Uh, these large built custom homes was designed in a revival style that was popular in the 1920s and the use of decorative glazed ceramic tile 
contributes to the home's overall ambiance, including the Tao Fountain, uh, which is a Parisian style. In looking at uh, the feeling of the property, because of the careful siting of the residents, nestled into the steep rocky hillside uh, it, at the end of Talkwitz Canyon Way, the home retown, re retains the integrity of a feeling of a highly articulated private residence that evokes luxury and wellness to its original owners. In the association, the residence retains its association with a highly accomplished architectural engineer of Dodd and Richards and his notable first owner, uh, Roland uh, P. Bishop. So when you evaluate a class one property, you look at the defining characteristics of the site. Uh, there are several defining characteristics that uh, we'd like to highlight. Uh, the presence of the east set of steps, and I'll have some pictures showing that in just a minute. Uh, heavy masonry corbel, corbels supporting the balcony, ornamental vents at the gables, two-piece clay roof tiles, and the perimeter rock wall, which is very distinctive, lush gardens, patios, and terraces, and windows and wall sconces and lanterns. Also in your staff report, there is a list of, of non-contributing characteristics, uh, and you can see those 14 in the staff report. So as I mentioned, there are some uh, photographs of the balcony with the, the corbels underneath the balcony, the railings, the windows, uh, the stu smooth stucco walls, and the two, tile, or the two uh, clay, clay tiles. Uh, once again, this is looking down the hillside onto the terraces at the back of the property. And that completes my report, Chair. The staff, uh, the HSPB did go on a site visit. You all saw the, reviewed the site back in July. Uh, and staff is recommending a pro class one designation. Board, are there questions of, of staff? And I just have one minor thing, um, comment to mention about the, the timing. It was actually September that we did the site review very oh, small not so hot <laughs> detail <then>. <laughs> anyway so board are there questions of staff See, seeing no further <clears throat> questions of staff uh, i'll open the public hearing is the applicant present please come to the mic and give your name and address and tell us about your project you have 10 minutes 10 minutes. And yeah. two um, minutes for rebuttal morning, if board. there is me. <laughs> Tracy Conrad, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Steve Vaught, who wrote the extensive nomination, is here to answer any of your questions. Uh, we very much appreciate your consideration uh, for this Palm Springs treasure. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Comrad. We really appreciate your comments and interest in, in, in the no nomination. Are there um, other public um, <clears throat> comments from the audience? Please come forward and state your <coughs> name. And you have... Good morning, board. It's nice to see you all again. Um, it's Steve Vaught from uh, Riverside at the present time. Um, I'm just here, as Tracy was uh, kind enough to mention, I did write the nomination uh, on her behalf for the uh, Bishop House and would be uh, delighted to answer any questions if anyone uh, has anything on it. Uh, as you know, it's a, it is a treasure. It's, a, it's just a fabulous house, and I'm thrilled to have had any, any association with it. Just Great report. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a labor of love, as they were. It's <laughs> obvious. Yes, Mr. Nelson. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that the nomination was very, very well written. Oh. <clears throat> and I really enjoyed reading it. Oh. So thank you for all of your hard work on that. Oh, thank you so much. I always think it's going to be terrible until I finish it. <laughs> so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Anything else? Okay, thank you, Mr. Right. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else from the audience wishing to speak? No? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. So the action is now with the board. Board, uh, are there further questions or comments um, on this case? I have comments. Mr. Lavoy. Um, in, in, it's an excellent report, thank you, and very thorough. But um, I, I'm noticing that the most important character-defining feature is left off the list. That is the Spanish colonial revival slash Andalusian style of the architecture. That's the most important characteristic of it. Everything else is secondary to it. So I wish that would be added to the 
character defining features. Um, in the um, uh, in the staff report, uh, on the first page and third page, and uh, there, let's see, third line down. Um, it, it, the line starts 1925 in a highly detailed. Um, I would suggest the more appropriate word is authentically detailed. Um, as Spanish colonial of the Bible goes, this is pretty plain like it's supposed to be. Um, so if that would be changed in two places. It's on page one, the first cover page, and on page three, uh, fourth paragraph up. The line ends in Spanish. Okay. Otherwise, I do support the nomination as stated. I, I will second this if that's a motion. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Uh, I just have one comment. I, too, support the nomination, not only for the piece of property as it is, but completing the with the willows next to it. It becomes greater than just one house. This becomes a whole piece of Palm Springs history. And the two houses together make it even stronger than just one. Yeah, totally agree with it. Absolutely. Board? Any other questions? Seeing none, may we now have the motion? I think you have an amendment. Uh, you know, I'm I just spaced out on how we're supposed to say this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a motion to um, accept the nomination and forward it to the city council with a recommendation for a class one site. Um, with the, um, actually the condition that added to the character defining features is the Spanish colonial revival slash Andalusian style of the house. I'll second the motion. Um, I would like to, for the motion to contain the criteria two, three, four, and five because the staff report uh, indicates that those four meet um, meet the criteria to make this class one, but if you read the conclusion, it eliminates two oh. as part of the criteria. So I would like it stated two, three, four, and five. I accept the amendment. Okay, we have uh, a first by Mr. Lavoy with uh, the amendment as approved, and second by Ms. Dixon. <coughs> <coughs> Board, any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, seven to zero. Congratulations. And Mr. Chair will note in the approving resolution the change to the defining characteristics and the criterion. Thank you. Thank right. you. Okay, the next item is 3B. Uh, this is an application by Diane Budman Ball. <coughs> on behalf of the Diane <clears throat> Budman Ball Family Trust. The owner requesting class one historic resource <clears throat> designation of the Kirk Douglas residence located at 515 West Bialola Drive. May I have a staff report, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, once again, this is the Kirk Douglas residence located at 515 West Lola Drive. So the Kirk Douglas house uh, is before you today as uh, the residence of famous actor Kirk Douglas, who lived at the house uh, for a period of time. And uh, the report that was written to, uh, for you today was written by Susan Secor Jensen, architect, preservation consultant, and uh, we will rely on that information uh, to relay our basis of our analysis of the staff report. So as I mentioned earlier in the previous presentation, there are a set of standards and conditions and criteria that we use to evaluate uh, show, show, should a house be a class one historic property. Uh, the photograph that is before you today is from the rear of the house, uh, looking towards uh, from the pool, I'm sorry, the tennis pavilion towards the rear. 
this is a front of the house. It's, it's not as visible from the street. Uh, there's a stone wall currently that um, shields it from view. So looking at our, our criterion that we use to uh, determine if it uh, meets the findings for a class one historic site, uh, the person of significance that lived in the house is Kirk Douglas, who was an actor. Uh, uh, he resided there uh, for several years. He occupied the home for roughly four decades. Uh, on page 25 of the report, it describes the significance of the contributions that Douglas made to life in Palm Springs as well as an international known actor. In criterion number three, modernist, modernist style post and beam, uh, the house that was built uh, is custom and it is a post and beam construction uh, which was popular during the post-war period. The period of significance of the home also relates to the time during which Douglas owned and occupied the house. Uh, and we feel that this is, uh, which the time was from 59 to 1999 and we feel that this uh, style meets that criteria. Criterion number four, uh, does the, the resource embody a distinctive characteristic of a time period and, and method of construction? Uh, it is a mid-century modern design architecture, uh, use of expansive use of glass, strong horizontal expression of the overall structure uh, is evident, exposed beams and wood structures of the, of the roof and other elements of the home and a minimal amount of ornamentation and simplicity in form in the overall design. Uh, however, there are some additions that were made to the home in 1964 and 1976 that obscure some of the clean lines and simplicity uh, which the architects uh, Wexler and Harris, Harrison first uh, built the house. As such, the residence exhibits many characteristics of mid-century modern, but is not an outstanding example of of this design, of this, of these features. So criteria number five, is the resource present, presently the work of a master builder, architect, designer? Uh, and the answer is yes, it was designed by Wexler and Harrison, uh, who were two famous architects. Uh, their firm in 1952 built the residence uh, it reflects many of the design tenets of Wexler and Harrison redefined throughout the, the early part of their careers, which was minimal use of materials, post and beam construction, uh, responsiveness to the harsh desert environment. Uh, in the report, uh, it notes that in 1964, there were a series of additions, al alterations that were made to the, the Douglas residents, uh, who were designed by another architect, uh, Michael M. H. Harrison. Uh, the additions substantially altered the <coughs> Wexler-Harrison design, obscuring and diminishing the simplicity of the clean lines, uh, and uh, which no longer stands as a noteworthy example of the work of Wexler and Harrison. Uh, thusly, staff would assert that the residence does not possess a high artistic value, is not an outstanding example of the work of these master architects, and thus does not qualify as a historic resource under this criterion number five. So once again, we use uh, the certain uh, evaluation, the seven aspects of our of qualities of integrity, which we'll go over right now. So the location, uh, obviously it's in the original parcel and location. Uh, the design, it's a, a Wexler designed. Uh, However, as we mentioned earlier, there's been additions and alterations to the property that has diminished this, uh, the overall original design. Uh, there have been, al the alterations include trellis-like roof eaves, a shade structure at the center of the back of the house, louvered wood awnings at the center, at the back of the elevation, uh, windows along the sides of the house have been changed, and in addition spans mostly the front of the home which obscures the original front elevation. These additions were done during the period that Douglas owned the home. Uh, however, it, it diminished the architectural integrity of the house and staff asserts that it does not contribute to the historic significance of the site. In addition, a tennis pavilion was added in 1976 and was designed by Michael H. Morrison. Uh, so material, um, site, siting, the, the site retains the integrity. Uh, it was a custom home built in the Las Palmas neighborhood and that, that can be met. Materials, 
Uh, the original portions of the house were constructed of wood, glass, and stucco in the post and beam method of construction. The later additions were the same material, although some portions appear to have been uh, constructed from standard wood frame and stucco construction, and the alterations have diminished the integrity of the materials used. In workmanship, it's a below average for a custom home. Uh, if the HSPB toured the site uh, and was uh, saw some of the uh, workmanship that was on the exterior, there are conduits uh, that are attached to the, the side, there are retractable awnings, uh, there are other elements, lights and so on, that were not original to the house. Uh, based upon deterioration, deferred maintenance on the existing home, uh, staff does not feel that uh, materials are, are up to uh, par. Workmanship. So uh, the workmanship, as I mentioned, based upon the, the current state of the portions of the home are not up to that standard. Uh, the feeling, the house does maintain a feeling of a rambling casual family home that was, would have been built in the mid-century uh, period, so it does meet that uh, association. Um, and then with the association of Kirk Douglas, uh, he did live in the house, uh, it was a middle-class family, uh, and he chose to live within Palm Springs and build a second house, which is, it meets that association. So if I could jump to this slide, this is the house, which is the, the original footprint of the house is in, in orange. The area of an addition was in 1964 is the purple, and then one more addition in 1976. So as you can see, uh, the house has been altered over the years. So going back to the defining characteristics, uh, the Historic Preservation Board would need to define these characteristics in order to make this a class one uh, designated site. Uh, there are floor-to-ceiling glass on the south elevation. There are thin horizontal fascias at the roof line, field stone walls, and the tennis pavilion also has uh, defining characteristics. In your staff report, there are other non-contributing features that include the landscape hardscape, uh, pull-down sunshades on the raised shade structure in the back of the house, a retractable awning on the side of the house, and then, as I mentioned, the 64 and the 76 additions uh, to the southwest corner of the home. So based upon uh, the report and staff's evaluation, the residence does meet the definition of historic resource based on criterions two, three, four, and retains a fair degree of historic integrity However, lacks integrity in terms of key factors of design, materials, and workmanship. Uh, we've concluded, staff has concluded that the findings can be made to support a class one historic des designation based upon the site's association with Kirk Douglas. However, given the physical lack of integrity of design, materials, and construction um, that have <coughs> impaired the original Wexler Harrison design caused by the 64 and 76 additions, the physical condition of the site may make it better candidate for a class two historic resource status. So Chair, that concludes my report and I'll answer any questions and uh, the applicant is here. Thank you. Board, questions of staff. Mr. Nelson. Not really a question. Uh, is it okay to make a comment about the yes. report at this time? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to point out um, a couple of things. Um, under criterion two, even though the period of significance uh, is mainly associated with Kirk Douglas and his residency in the house, I think it's important uh, to the local history that the original owner was Robert Howard, who was extremely important to our local history, and that should be noted in uh, that criterion uh, for the final um, recommendation that's sent to city council. Uh, Robert Howard uh, just so everyone knows what the owner of the Howard Manor and uh, very instrumental in uh, local civic affairs and his wife Andrea owned a jewelry store later on and uh, the name in the, in the community is very well known. Uh, the other point I would like to make is on page, uh, there was, uh, page 6 from 11. Uh, the top line says Kramer resident, which is a typo. That should say Douglas Revenue. Uh, and then 
uh, on page 22, talking about the architecture. Uh, in the fourth paragraph, beginning with Ad Divine by Wexler and Harrison, it talks about the Douglas is purchasing an additional parcel of property to add a tennis pavilion and tennis court. It's important to note that that property was more adjacent to the former Vadi Bunker estate. And Vadi Bunker was a pump and pioneer and owned a Bunker's garage. So um, I could do additional research if necessary to determine that that was in fact part of her property. But it's worth noting that uh, it may have been because it was adjacent to her home. And I believe that's all I have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great comments. I appreciate that. Mr. Chair, yes. will those comments be included in the staff report? Because I think they're very important. Yeah, certainly, if included as part of your motion, we would incorporate those as the item goes okay. forward to City Council. Thank you. Yes, we should definitely do that. Or, any, open public comment? Any, other, uh, any other comments? From, I have a comment. From the, okay, please. Um, the, this is one of those ones that I, you know, as an historian, get my knickers in a twist about. Um, <laughs> uh, again, the, one of the character-defining features is the style of architecture. That's the first one that should be mentioned. Um, and period of significance. Um, okay, if the, if the period of significance is when Kirk Douglas lived there, he's responsible for most of these changes. So would Kirk Douglas recognize this house as his if he drove up to it? The answer is probably yes. So um, its significance as a Harrison and Wexler is diminished, but it's not as Kirk Douglas's house. So um, I would be recommending a class one based on period of significance and the additions, how, how much they compromise um, the original really quite lovely design, and, and I agree. They are not great architecture, they are not good design, they totally compromise it. One walks through there going, what were they thinking of? But that's what it looked like, that's what Kirk Douglas did to that house. That's part of history. That's what this story, this, what, that's what this site is telling us. Thank you. Any other comments, any other questions? I would also like to say, I mean, I would support this for a class one as well. As far as the workmanship on some of the areas of the house, these owners are relatively new, and they are doing substantial work on the house moving forward. I don't know if everything that is in this report is going to be repaired, but they're working on the house continually, and I think that the work that they are doing will improve the property and maintain it in a state that's very important to this community. Any other comments? Well, I, I, have we heard that from the owners? I just know from going by the house, it's on my walk route, mm -hmm. and there's workmen there all the time, continually, and so they are upgrading it all the time. Seeing no um, further questions of staff, I'll open the public hearing. Is the applicant present? Please come to the mic, give your name and address, and tell us about your project. You have 10 minutes to present and two minutes for rebuttal if desired. Okay, good morning, Susan Sequoia Jensen. I'm representing the owners of the property. I did write the nomination. I do have a strong conviction that it should be a class one. As an architect, I too struggled with the initial evaluation because I admire Wexler and Harrison's work immensely. And this is not a prime example of their work. However, it is a prime example, as Mr. Lavoy stated, of Mr. Douglas's residency for 40 years at this home. And it is in very good condition regarding the period of significance when Mr. Douglas and his family were residents here. So I'm basically here to answer questions. I think we all have some of the same issues as far as is it a Wexler and Harrison? Not so much, but they did establish the vocabulary and it does remain a fine example of desert modernism. 
It's an extraordinary complex, including the pool, the tennis pavilion, the tennis court. The history, as stated, is incredibly significant to the city of Palm Springs, starting from the Howards to Robert Higgins to Kurt Douglas, and now the current owners who do happen to uh, be affiliated with Michael Douglas and his family. And so there is a great deal of concern and care for preserving the legacy here. Thank you. Are there other um, <clears throat> public comments from the audience? Could, could I ask a question? Oh, yes, you have a question? Yeah, um, I, 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 I seem to remember reading in the report, we had a lot of reading this week, um, that you weren't able to find much about the architect who did the additions. He's actually the, not an architect. It's Morrison is the oh. last name. and a designer that obviously worked with the Douglases in Los Angeles. Okay. And in a way, that supports the integrity of what Wexler and Harrison did. There was not another ego battling with the vocabulary that was originally <laughs> established. The ego was Kirk Douglas. So uh, he had it done his way. That's where you go there. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there other um, <clears throat> public comments from the audience? I would, I would, would you please come forward? Yeah. Please state your name. Good morning. My address. name is Barton Jankel in Santa Monica, California. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Sorry, you you us, sorry about that. You brought us this great weather then. Thank you. I, I'm hoping so. It just says, <laughs> can you find Santa Monica? Um, I'm Barton Janke. I live in Santa Monica, California. I'm an architectural designer. Um, I have the privilege of working very closely with Diane Bald and Michael Budman. Um, I am in the process of finishing the Hunt House in Malibu by Craig Elwood, which we just had put on the National Register. Um, they also own the family of Lloyd Wright Jr. in Los Angeles and Hollywood. Um, I think that uh, if anyone is going to own this home, this is the family you want to welcome into this community and have part of Palm Springs. They open the home, obviously, during you know several times in the year for tours, and they put up with the buses driving by, and they really love it. Um, Diane has asked me to say a couple of things as she couldn't be here today, uh, and I think she wanted me to give you a little human interest. Um, when they purchased the home, uh, Gary Wexler, who I'm sure some of you know, um, came in the home and basically was almost brought to tears about how the home has uh, evolved over the years and how his father probably would have been very um, happy and pleased with the way that Diane and Michael have the home at the moment. Um, as well, uh, you know, obviously you know the history of the tennis with uh, Dinah Shore. They used to have the tennis tournaments and all the fun there as far as the historical uh, celebrity aspect. Um, several presidents have stayed in the home over the years. I think there were multiple uh, Hollywood affairs that went on probably somehow in, in, within the home, you know, and uh, people stayed over the years. Um, gosh, I'm just, let me look at here. I don't know. They're, they're very good preservationists. They're people that um, are getting ready to do some work, obviously. I, I know it'll be tasteful. I know that uh, they're just amazing family, and uh, I've had the privilege of working with them, and, um, you know, they, you couldn't ask for anything better. I mean, had, had have the if the bones were there, they would have kept the bones for sure. Uh, the Craig Elwood House out in Malibu is literally going to be the original home again uh, from the materials that I've acquired over the years. So they're purists, and uh, I, I feel that you're really lucky to have them as the owners and to be able to welcome uh, people into the home. So anything you'd like to ask, obviously, because I do know a lot about what they're doing as well, and um, it's pretty good. Thank you. Thank you so much. We of really course. appreciate your coming over here to talk to us. Oh, I love it. This. You know, I mean, they're important. they're basically, they've adopted me like a family member, and they're those people. I mean, they're wonderful. Okay. I think that they would probably love to get involved with you guys. I mean, they really, special family. I do Thank you. Have of Just course. One question. Awesome. Well, you're here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, on the staff report, the four items they listed are non-contributing features. Um, 
you know, the pull down fender shade, the retractable awning. These are obviously things that could easily be taken off. Sure. Do the owners have any plan to remove those items? You know, I think Steve can probably speak to that, who is an architect uh, who has been doing the plans with Diane. I'm literally here to speak on behalf of the family, you know, and to, uh, it, you know, just talk for them as people and human interest. Okay. Thank yeah. You. I think I have one more thing to say is how, how Michael, when he came to the house, Michael Douglas, uh, and met them and has kept up with them and they even FaceTime with Kirk and Ann sometimes just to walk around the house and give them some memories and uh, Michael when he came in he sat in every chair in the house and uh, had a lot of emotional moments and felt really pleased with the home still being intact from his memories so it's a special place right. all right thank, thank you, you. All. thank you all we very so much appreciate your time. of course <clears throat> Any other uh, public comments? Please come to the <clears throat> table. State your name. You've got three minutes. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, Steve Payline, uh, 2204 Caliente Drive, Palm Springs. I'm the architect working with Diane on the current project, which is mostly infrastructure-based. We're, um, we're going to rewire the house, um, uh, replace some aging HVAC equipment, and remove it from the roof to clean um, so, so a lot of the premise is to, is to, is to improve the infrastructure of the house, uh, as well as some plumbing work, um, across the whole house. And as part of that, we are going to remove a lot of the conduit that's, that's on the walls and, and pull it inside and, and more appropriately deal with that, uh, for the house. So we're basically, plans are sub submitted and approved. We're waiting to select a contractor, um, at the moment to, to start that work. Um, the other thing I would like to say is, is I know some of there have been additions and modifications to the house, and, and just looking at the house as an architect myself, walking through it, I think the a lot of the additions were very sympathetic to the style. Um, they didn't introduce any elements that weren't sort of mid-century in a way in terms of the cleanliness of the architecture. They did uh, in closing the front. Um, with the the front atrium, I think actually makes a really beautiful statement in the front of the house. The, the the open atrium in the front that you walk through that used to be part of the outdoor patio. So I would say, you know, I certainly, as an architect working with with Diane and and her commitment to bringing the house, uh, you know, uh, to a to a level uh, to a, to a much higher level, I would support the class one designation. Thank you Questions? so much. Um, what a great project that yeah. you ended up with. Um, are there any other comments? Uh, from the audience? Please come forward. State your name. Please. Your address. You have three moment, Three minutes. Uh, my name is Tom Jakeway, and I didn't intend to speak on this item. It's just a coincidence that I was here. But I worked for Don Wexler starting in 1975 through 1982. Wow. And we designed that tennis pavilion. I'm very surprised to hear in the staff report that they had a different architect on it. It was an interesting situation. The Douglases had their house, and then there was a kind of a key lot, a flag lot, in between that and the old Dinah Shore house. And Jim and Peggy Greenbaum owned the Dinah Shore house at that time, and they got together with the Douglases to build the court and the tennis pavilion together. And I dealt mostly with Ann Douglas and Peggy Greenbaum. And um, the style of the tennis pavilion was different, certainly, than this house, probably more in keeping with the um, Dinah Shore house, but definitely was Don Wexler's work. Now, maybe somebody else completed the drawings or something, so there might be a different name in the city records. but. Um, there was the the intention to have an integrity between the two properties with the same architectural designer having worked on both. And my hand drew the drawing, so I, I know that it was done in Don's office. Wow, we're just learning all sorts of interesting things this morning. <laughs> well, how do we incorporate that statement into I, this report? Uh, yeah, okay. What we might do is ask Mr. Jakeway to get together with Ms. Sequoy Jensen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, we invite you all to come more often. We love learning all of this. So this is great. So are there any other public comments? No? Oh, one more. Please come forward.
This is, um, it's wonderful because it, it further strengthens the reason that this should be a class one. Um, the records indicated that uh, it was permitted under Morrison. So that might be the disparity there, but we will continue to try to resolve. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled that it has the Wexler um, pedigree that it has, so. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. The action is now with the board. Board, are there further questions or comments on the case? I'm sure there will be. So, Mr. Yes, Chair, um, I would. I'm in support of um, Class One historic uh, site designation, uh, primarily because of you know this rich historic value to our city. You know, with uh, Kirk Doug Douglas and his family living there for 40 years. He, you know, was a major uh, part of our history, and and this was his house, and this is how he lived, and his taste, um, you know, during the modern period is is very significant, um, and I get goosebumps, um, you know, really thinking about it, and I visited the house when Kirk and Ann Douglas lived there, so it, it's part of our history, so I'm very supportive. Thank you, Mr. Rosenau. Thank you. Uh, I would like to echo my colleagues. I am supporting supporting the uh, class one. Um, and just this morning on the way to this meeting, uh, I saw the celebrity tour bus go by. <laughs> and I know that in a matter of minutes, that would be full of tourists going by the, the Kirk Douglas house for that very reason. So uh, I am in support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, okay. Yes. Uh, looking at the criteria again, please. Uh, criteria, uh, 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 not not that. That. That criterion five needs to be modified. That um, the the original core of the house and pool pavilion or a uh, tennis pavilion were by Wexler and Harrison and modified under the Douglas tenancy. And with that change, I'll make a motion to forward to City Council with a recommendation for Class 1. I'll second. We have a first by Mr. Lavoy and a second by Ms. Hoff. And okay. we will note for the record that the motion includes the modification to criterion number five as read into the record. Thank you. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, seven to zero. Moving right along to 3C, um, an application by <clears throat> Garth Gilpin and <clears throat> Anna Elizabeth Smalley, owners requesting Class 1 historic resource designation of 1441 North Korea Road, the Liberace residence. May I have a staff report, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, I was notified uh, by a member of the public that the applicant, and I'll just see if the applicant is here. Okay. Thank you. That the applicant may wish to continue this item. And so what I'd recommend, Mr. Chair, we'll go ahead and skip the staff report for now, but if you would open the public hearing so that the applicant could speak and any members of the public can speak. Uh, and then based on that testimony, what I might ask you to do is to continue this item to a date certain. So with that, Mr. Chair, if you would open the public hearing. Okay. So I'll open the public hearing. Please come to the mic. Give your name and address and tell us about the project. Good morning, Stephen Keelan, 1141 South Cayo Marcus, Palm Springs. So, yeah, I think considering that this new definition of class two is still unclear to a lot of people, including me, I think we want to postpone this and get a better handle on what it means. Um, but I wanted to use this time to really get a clear definition of what class two status really is, what does, what's the difference between class one and class two, and most importantly, does class two uh, warrant the Mills Act? Is it, are class two properties eligible for the Mills Act? I'm really happy you brought that up because I think there still <laughs> is some, some question on several people's mind and it is new. 
So it's, it's, it's good for us to address that. So, Mr. Fagg, would you like to chime in here? And yes, if the, the public official? hearing is closed. I don't know, does the owner wish to speak as well? Uh, you know, I'd speak, but I want to hear, I'd like to hear uh, okay. right. why it's classed. Certainly. I don't want to make a comment until I know what's... Of course. What's the, Absolutely. With the adoption of our new historic preservation ordinance, one of the changes we made was expanding the classes of designation. We now have, instead of three classes, we have four classes. One of the changes was specifically to the class two designation, which typically in the past we had used class two uh, for those sites where the historic resource no longer existed. For example, the Desert Inn property is a class two designation. However, with the change in the ordinance, class two has taken on a new significance. Um, class one is defined as those properties that meet our criteria in terms of um, its uh, presence in the community relative to either its architecture, its association uh, with historic individuals or historic events. Uh, and then class one also has the assessment for integrity using the Secretary of the T Interior standards. So for class one, it needs to meet both the city's criterion and the um, uh, integrity. For class two, it was modified to meet only the city standards, but not the requirement for integrity under the Secretary of the Interior standards. However, one of the changes with the ordinance is that the class two still has the same protections as a class one but also has the same benefits. So new class two properties that are designated under the new ordinance are eligible for the Mills Act. So again, it has the same protections, it receives the same benefits, but it does not have the same integrity as a class one. I think in our discussions, Mr. Lavoie, we called those structures of merit or resources of merit um, that may not have the integrity, but still have the key characteristics of association or methods of construction, et cetera. So th those are the differences. May I ask another question? So the things that have been previously designated class two, Will those remain class two, or are if they're now, what would be the definition of class three? They or will remain class two. However, uh, in terms of qualifying for a Mills Act contract, we would need to evaluate those on a case by case basis. Okay. Yeah. So I think that we will postpone this for now and regroup and come back. Um, so, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm really glad you brought this up. This is really important, and we need to continue to inform the, the, the community exactly, you know, how what what these changes are and and their significance. So, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Yes. A question of staff. So the class two, the already designated class two, are we sending out any information to them, telling them what they can do now? To become, uh, to be, ha to have the designation to use the Mills Act and other protection. No, we haven't sent out individual mailers to the Class Two properties. But, however, should they contact us, we would go ahead and review their case with them on an individual basis. Do you think it's important for us as a city to be proactive and do that? It would be a very good thing for Mr. Lyon, as the Historic Preservation Officer, to do. Yes. <laughs> Let's put that in his to-do box. <laughs> we'll add it to his list of yes. tasks, especially why he's not here today. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what happens but when you take vacation. <laughs> okay. Okay, then. Um, we need to uh, change the format here a little bit. Uh, a motion to postpone. That, what I would request is that because this is a public hearing item, I would request that we continue this to a date certain. And if the owner is in agreement, it would be the October 8th. I think he just uh, October, let me know. Okay. So okay, so we'll go ahead and postpone this to the November HSPB meeting. Okay, so we really don't need a motion, right? I, I have a question. So yes. will um, a new report be given to us then? Yes, we'll uh, go ahead and generate the materials again for set you. Set aside and a new one would be presented to Yes, us we will do that. Uh, Mr. Chair, we do still need a motion and a second um, to continue this to a date certain of the November HSPB okay. meeting. 
before we do that, I just have a comment. Uh, I think it's worth noting something to chew on for the next couple months. Is, uh, this is a very similar situation, in my view, to the Kirk Douglas House. The period of significance when they actually lived there, that's what is important about the house. That's what we're looking at when we designate. It's not about when it was built or who lives there now, what's going on now. It's about the fact that it was owned by the most flamboyant entertainer in the world who had multiple homes in this town. So just something for everyone to chew on. Okay, right. <laughs> and if I could add, and what it looked like when he lived there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really important. And I've seen this come up in the past somewhat, but we've really not addressed it this way. So this is another good thing that's come out of this, this meeting for us to really pay attention to going forward. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chair, this is an aside, but I think that it might be something interesting for our symposium is to address how important a Class II designation is. Mm -hmm because I just learned a great deal, and I have a lot more respect for what a Class II designation is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know yeah. before that, and so mm -hmm. I think that it's important for the public I to agree. know, and I but think that maybe we should consider that. Yeah. Since you're one of the members of that particular committee, I think you, you, you will remind <laughs> us there, right? Well, yes. <laughs> you have a new test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, now we are, we, we need to have a motion here. Okay, go to the motion. Second. And we have a motion by uh, Mr. Rosenow and a second by Ms. Dixon. So all in, uh, any other questions? Any in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, seven to zero. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to unfinished business. So the first item is 5A, an application by, pardon? There is no unfinished business. No, but I'm sorry, I skipped right down to new business. There is no unfinished business. <laughs> new business, thank you very much. Okay, an application by Catherine Bosner, owner for Class 1 Historic Resource Designation of 2821 Livemore Avenue, the Sunmore Model Home, HSPB 124. May I have a motion to accept the historic resources report and schedule site visits? I'll make a motion to uh, do that. <laughs> we have a motion. To, mm -hmm. Floor, second. second. Can so, I make a comment? And, yes, please. Um, I'm excited to read this report. Uh, I've been to the house several times for personal business, and it's a truly beautiful home, and you should be very excited to, uh, to take a look at this house. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have a first by um, Ms. Huff and a second by Ms. Dixon. So, <clears throat> any other further discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries, seven to zero. Item 5B, an application by the Marito Manor Community Association for a <clears throat> district designation of Marito Manor located at 197 West Marito Place. May I have a motion to accept the historic resources report and schedule site visits? Move to approve. We have a, a, a motion and we, ha we have a second. We have a motion by Ms. Ms. Dixon and a second by, uh, and we you have a question by Mr. LeBoy. Uh, yeah, there's a mistake. Um, it's a misquote um, by, on page 64. At the bottom of the page, um, and the original source was incorrect um, in Mr. Burgess's obituary. Uh, on page 64 at the bottom, he did not design the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. It was done by Richard Morris Hunt. Um, he did design the Santa Barbara Children's Museum. Can you turn your mic on? I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Burkus did not design the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. It was by Mr. Hunt. Um, he did design the Santa Barbara Children's Museum and is perhaps his last commission. Oh. So we have a, 
we need to have a correction to the. Uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was, well, it may be a correct quote of the, um, of the paper article of his obituary, but the obituary was miscorrect and should be noted in a footnote that it's incorrect. Okay, do we need to have an amended a motion? Um, the motion. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, you have yeah, right. Yeah, you have your motion and second. Uh, Member okay. Dixon and uh, Mr. Rosenauer were the motion and second. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, it's time for a vote. Those <clears throat> those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The motion carries seven to zero. Item five B. Uh, application by the Marino Manor Community Association for a historic district designation. Let's see, Mr. Chair, we just uh, completed item that item. C, an application by the City of Palm Springs for a historic designation of the Thomas McDonald Golf Course Residence Committee of 15 and related structures located at 301 North Pilardo Road. May I have a motion to accept the historic resources report and schedule site visits? So we have a first. We have a second. Second. First by Mr. Lavoy. Oh, you have I, a question. I have a question. Yes. Um, Can you turn this, your mic on? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, this report is suggesting that we do this in two phases and um, that the house and the golf course be separate. And I would like to ask staff at this point if we don't agree with two phases, may we make a motion for this report to come back to us to be inclusive of all the properties and the golf course? You actually don't need to do that. What you'll note is that in your package, you have the full report with Correct. you. And so at the public hearing in October, you can discuss that point. Uh, what I would recommend uh, is uh, just so you have an understanding, back on June 5th at City Council, Mayor Moon requested the designation of the clubhouse, the golf course clubhouse. Uh, and so that was the direction given by staff was to pursue the historic resources report for that. Now, I'm assuming that PSPF has not contacted the Mayor City Council about the entire golf course. Is that correct? haven't had discussions with them. I have no idea. Yeah, so yeah. the city council may decide that they want to see the entire thing. I don't know. It's just the direction that was given to us was solely for the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And so we would recommend that PSPF discuss that with the mayor and city council. We will also follow up with them as well. And I'm not speaking on behalf of the mayor by any means, <laughs> but he may not realize the importance of, a la of the land in conjunction with the buildings. Um, you know, he's always said he wanted to be on the HSPB board, but he didn't feel he was qualified, so he ran for mayor. So, you know, he, he just may not realize how important this is that we keep this property together. Yeah, and that may be the case. His comments from the June 5th meeting, I believe, were relative to an event that was recently held at the clubhouse that he had attended. And sure. so that's why he was interested in the designation of that particular structure. But again, you're receiving the entire report. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, quick question before we vote can you repeat of what the motion was that was yeah. made yes motion the, the motion was to accept the report and to schedule site visits okay right. but there's no amendments as far as, that, as far as i know so okay okay so we have a first and a second so uh no further discussion seeing none those in favor aye, aye. aye. those opposed the motion carries Seven to zero. Oh, we're moving on to discussions. That would be me. Um, or this uh, talking about uh, five A is the symposium. So um, we had our first subcommittee meeting on August the 29th to, um, we went through uh, a number of different um, ideas and proposals and um, we came up with um, some, uh, some specific categories and things that I'm gonna share with you. But first of all, and uh, subcommittee members, I just learned this actually 
late last uh, yesterday afternoon, is that uh, I, I had a discussion with the convention center uh, about um, our proposed dates, and the date that is available for us is Saturday, the September the 18th. That would be for our main event. We call it the main event. And that would be Saturday afternoon. And then the workshops would be Sunday afternoon. And it would be a half day of workshops, not a full day of workshops. So we would be talking about a Saturday uh, afternoon and a Sunday afternoon. Well, yes? Yeah. April. April. You did say September. September. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a lot of work to do in the next two days. <laughs> yes. This got a little ahead of me, I think. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> April the 18th, yes. Yes, 20, and that's 2020. Pardon? 17 and 18? No, the 18th 18 and 19th. 19. Right, okay. So those are two after two afternoons. And we would have our load-in at the convention center on the 17th is the way that would, way that would work. So um, he's got that on hold of me, so I'll get back to, uh, I'll get back to him. Um, so we, we talked about the, th uh, the theme for this year, and um, we w w definitely determined that there's going to be a lot of emphasis on restoration and renovation and repurpose. And uh, what we also want to talk about and talked about a theme of the hidden Palm Springs treasures. Um, there's a lot of properties that um, are not easily accessible and some that people may not even know about. Um, so it's kind of blending those two together, but always with the emphasis on what we're all about in restoration, renovation, repurposing. So um, there, and particularly there are two restoration major ones that we are hoping to, um, that we'll be working on to have a part to, uh, as a presentation. And we'll know more about that uh, probably by the next meeting. Um, also, uh, we want to have a presentation on what does preservation mean to Palm Springs? And um, we feel this is very, very important to talk about um, the, um, and it was particularly inspired, remember we went to that CPF workshop and the, it was, the focus was on about the economic value to the city and the importance that preservation has brought so we continually keep that forward. This audience that we have on the main event, there's a lot of people that are new to the, to the movement or just know a little bit about the movement, but we think it's important to uh, have an acknowledgement so we would have a, um, a panel uh, about that. Um, also, we would be doing uh, our recap again of sort of like the HSBB in review on 2019 uh, which would include our designations, like similar to what we did last year. Um, and we're going to have several, I believe, we, um, on the docket for that. But these we will, you know, we won't be talking about each one of them in any great length, but we'll be, um, we'll be presenting them. And um, so we will, um, we took, did a lot of sifting through all of this. We also started putting times to what we're talking about. Um, and we are beginning to refine that right up in, in, in the very beginning. And then on the workshops, um, the second day, uh, we're looking at um, a, a couple of venues. One could be the convention center again in a <coughs> smaller space. Um, and also, uh, we're thinking could be the Camelot, was the other one I was thinking of. Um, not sure if the Canyon Theater is large enough. We have some investigating to do uh, on that. But um, on that workshop day, again, we're going to be inviting the um, organizations again um, to be uh, a part of this event as we did last year. 
and to consider sponsoring um, uh, one of the workshops, um, one of the individual presentations of the workshops, I should say. And we will be organizing that in November. We'll bring each of the five organizations together uh, to have that discussion and also be asking them to consider sponsoring um, a tour. Um, but some of the things that just a few things I'm going to throw out that we're thinking of for the workshops. Um, we've not had a presentation before on the Smoke Tree Ranch, and um, we'd very much like to do that. Definitely the Cornelia White House. Uh, it's just a significant example of preservation and the city owned property we want to do. Um, an adaptive reuse property. Uh, again, and um, a couple of other case study restorations. And um, so just sort of give you the flavor of where we're going, and then we'll be honing this down and have more to share with you in October. Any questions? Okay, thank you. So um, I think that um, this year's... Um, I think it's going to have a, uh, a more universal, maybe, appeal than last year. We were really quite specific with the Bauhaus movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, um, October um, 2019 Modernism Week show booth. Uh, also, Flynn, right? We're on schedule for that again. Correct, Mr. Chair. I just want to report that we will again have a city booth at the Modernism show. Uh, we are very appreciative for those individuals who have allowed us to do that free of charge. Uh, and so we'll have our usual handout of materials in terms of the designated properties, preservation in Palm Springs, et cetera. So again, we'll continue to do that as outreach on behalf of the HSPB. Okay. It's time for board comments. Board, what would you like to share with us? Mr. Rosenau. First of all, thank you for welcoming to this board. Uh, I feel right at home already. Good. Um, in reading the uh, minutes from prior meetings uh, to prepare myself, I noticed the uh, the work plan for the HSBB for the you know your the buildings you have outlined uh, that we want to work on. Uh, I just have a little concern for the uh, the gas building on Sunrise. Um, it's my understanding the building is no longer in use by the gas company and could potentially be up for sale. So uh, I feel that we should be very um, adamant in, in trying to protect that building as quickly as possible. Yeah, I I totally agree. In fact, we've had this conversation before, and I believe it has been sold, uh, from what I understand. But I'm not, I can't. I'll, I'll just comment on that briefly. I have had contact from an individual who was interested in purchasing the property uh, and continuing an office use within the building, and I had indicated to him how special the building was, uh, and that uh, we would certainly like to see that designated at a future date. Mr. Chair, yes, Mr. I did go past it in the last couple of days, and there's some fencing towards the back, some new fencing. So you might want to look to make sure everything's okay. Oh, I think we all should drive by there quite often. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Um, my turn for comment? Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, looking forward to getting to work, and uh, it's going to be a fun three years. I know that uh, a couple of you, maybe two or three of you, uh, with us for another year, but uh, Eric and I and Catherine and Linda, I believe, will be here for a while, so looking forward to it. Also, I wanted to uh, maybe direct this to staff. One of my things that I'll be uh, bringing to the table is uh, a little bit more um, advocacy for property that we should be uh, watching. <laughs> and, um, you know, in my course of my walking tours and also just in my daily drive around town, running errands, I always go by a handful of properties just to make sure nothing's happening. So I have a watch list, and I think these are some addresses we need to be very concerned about. Um, there's about four or five here, and I'm going to list them. Uh, one is 299 West Vereda Norte, uh, which is directly across from, uh, or very close to the Liberace House. Uh, it's under construction. It appears to be a mid-century modern house. Uh, there's a fence around it. They're doing some work there. 
535 Camino Fur, which I brought to Dick Burkett's attention over a year ago. It's a little, sweet, uh, original uh, Spanish revival bungalow, uh, almost at the end of Camino Fur before you get to uh, Via Monte Vista, and it backs up to 550 Via Lola, which everyone called the Goldie Hawn House, but it's not. Uh, the next one is 77 Potencia, which is by Ed Fickett. It's one of only two Ed Fickett houses in town, and it's still in the original family. And um, the uh, house has been passed down now for the third time throughout the family. And so the current family members who are occupying the home have hired H3K to do an interior renovation. Uh, I know the owners of H3K very well and they're friends of mine and they promised that the outside will not be touched too much, but that property should be nominated uh, because it's a very important example of a picket that hasn't been altered. Uh, and then 423 West Marito Place, which is really unfortunate that somebody didn't nominate this uh, a few years ago because it was all original. It's a, a Rick Harrison house, and it was built for a wealthy Jewish couple who were uh, upstanding members of Temple Isaiah who gave money to build it. And uh, there's currently a construction fence around it. They've uh, removed the entryway. They've removed the atrium. They've removed a lot of character-defining features from the front of this house, and it was truly the last uh, all-original mid-century modern home in Las Palmas, aside from the picket. So I brought this to the attention of Ken uh, during my orientation, and he said, you know, it's not on the list, so they got a permit. And that really should have been on the list. So I think we have work to do here. And the last one is uh, 695 Warm Fan Drive. Um, it escaped me at the moment which one that is, but I drove by, saw there was work being done. I was like, uh-oh, we need, we need to uh, look out for that one. So that's all for now, and uh, I hope that all of us can do our part in being proactive because it's, it's those things that we drive by on the way to work, on the way to our meeting, that we need to remember when we see uh, something questionable and bring that to the attention of staff. Hey, Thanks. I'd like to... Um comment on, on what you just mentioned. Uh, we, uh, we really, uh, everybody should be encouraged on the board and even outside of the community. I keep trying to spread the word. The, the report is um, done by humans and it's not 100%. So we need to continue adding to that and I know mm -hmm. Ken has added when I brought things to him before. And I think it's really important. But my question then on 423 West Marito Place, that would have been prior to 1978. So wouldn't that have come to to just a uh, attention review? Yes, the Historic Preservation Officer, because we're assuming that it's pre-1978 and a class four structure, that the Historic Preservation Officer would review any proposed uh, alterations to the exterior of the residence. Um, as Chair Burkett has indicated, our class three list that we have posted online is by no means intended to be complete. Um, Ken and I have both noticed that there's a couple of properties that we think should be on the list. Uh, and so he continues to uh, make notes of that and the idea that we'll continually update the class three list. And so Mr. Nelson, we certainly appreciate your efforts in identifying things that should be on the class three list that require a greater degree of scrutiny by the Historic Site Preservation Board for major alterations uh, to those important residences. So we appreciate you bringing that forward. Jade, have these been given to Ken, the ones that you just give, given us here to, to look at? Yeah, have these properties you just mentioned that there's concern about, have these been given to, to Ken to be able to take a look at for considering adding them? This is the first time I've Okay, about that's really important if you give them this think, list. Uh, one, of, one of the things I need to do is cross reference them to the list, but I'm not for sure that one of them is not on the list. Right, yes. And that concerns me uh, 
as Flynn just pointed out, I mean, mm -hmm. things that aren't there. So how do we, uh, in a, a timely fashion, make sure that things that aren't okay. on the list get on yeah. there? Because yeah. we have all kinds of things happening in the summertime, and that's when people seem to take advantage of things being a little quiet and food media. And it's very concerning to me. Yeah. Right. Do you, and so, it, on how to address, how to look and see if they are on the survey. Okay. Actually, we've made that very easy. Um, if you go onto the city's website, and you go under, it's the way I do it. You go under planning, and then I go to historic resources, and you, and you can bring up very quickly those properties. There's four different boxes there to come up, and one of them is deals with the survey. And you just have to be sure there's so much information on there. Uh, and it's all alphabetical by street. But as you, um, you'll need to do some expansion uh, and to enlarge the, the print as you go through it. Uh, but you start looking for the street and it's really easy to find. It's really made a significant difference. So that's the first check. That's what I always do. As as well. So, do you have any comments about that? Okay. Um, Mr. Lavoy. Um, uh, uh, what seems like a year ago now, uh, we reviewed the rather ambitious plans for the um, replacement of the racket club. Um, I, I think it is past time to bring that nomination back forward and make it active again and make city council make a decision whether they want to save it or tear it all down. Can, can I jump? Yes, I, I so I share your feelings. Uh, it is my understanding that um, the racket club is potentially coming back to us for a study session in October, and that would be a site visit in advance of that study session. So it's one to tie that into what you're talking about, because this has been really lingering a long time, and it is such an important property. But of greater concern but, is the plan we saw last time included none of the racket club. Right. No, I, I concur. So my question is, should we, would be the timing of request bill your I thoughts think on that it, in in order to have a study informed study session we need to read the report first and the report needs to be certified either by the board and and adopted by the city council I mean we, okay. we we've been told all these years that we we should wait by the we should wait by the owner Oh, yeah, and no. and and I heard her say there'll be a few mementos in the in the lobby. Yeah. They have no intention of preserving anything of the racket club. That's what I saw last time. So it's very important. I, I mean, the report's this thick. It it took a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, it's hugely detailed. Um, it you know. People have died now who have written it, and you know, it, it's time to resurrect it. And in order to have a, 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 a realistic study session, we need to either accept that report or toss it out and ask for a new one. So we'll go ahead and provide copies of the report to you in advance of the study session next month. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Very good point. Thank you. I. Are the new member, I don't have that report and would like to be able to have a copy of that. We'll print out new copies for everyone. Okay, great. Just, Thank I'm you. sure many of you don't have it, so okay. we'll just make sure that we get one for everyone. That's great. Okay. Thank you. I was going to bring up the Rack Club, but thank you for doing that. But my other um, comment that I have is uh, the status of, because I think November is their deadline of the Orchid Tree Inn. As to, has there been any movement, any? 
The applicants have submitted a new application to expand the property to include the multifamily properties on the north end of the site as part of the hotel development. Uh, however, the application is incomplete. Uh, as you've mentioned, Mr. Burkett, their entitlements will expire in November if they have not pulled building permits by then. Um, and proceeding with the new application uh, does not give them the opportunity to build. So uh, they do have a new application in. Uh, City Council uh, has reviewed in closed session their conformance to the security plan that was required as part of the extension of the entitlements. And so the City Council is very mindful of the property and its maintenance. So this additional uh, that they want to make, that still has a November deadline attached to it? So the so. current entitlements expire in November. If they file a new application, which they have, that doesn't give them any rights to do anything uh, at this point in time until those applications are improved. So there's going to be that would coming back to us again? I correct, guess. correct. As class one designated sites, the bungalows and the church, <laughs> uh, that application would have to come back before the Historic Site Preservation Board for a certificate of appropriateness. Okay, so we have, no, of course, we don't, at this point, we don't have any idea when that might be. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, they haven't responded to our requests for providing a complete application submittal. So if they don't supply it, help me out, what happens? So ultimately, if they don't proceed forward with the new application, the entitlements expire in November and the project is dead. Okay. And then there's still maintenance requirements both under uh, Section yeah. 805, the Historic Preservation Ordinance, and also under the City's Vacant Building Ordinance. Right. So at that time, there would probably be a, maybe a review on those maintenance things because you can see the property is just continuing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is another one. It's like the racket club in a way. It's been, I'll never forget our first HSBB um, uh, annual event was at the Women's Club right across the street just after that fire, I think. <laughs> I could still see it now. So Mr. that's six years ago. Mr. Chair, question of staff. What kind of fines do we have in place, and have the fines been increased? Because to me, um, what I see is a developer who's just prolonging, he's allowing yeah. deterioration, and right. then, oops, we can't do anything, it's too bad. Yeah. I, I, I don't have the specific amounts in front of me, but in the Historic Preservation Ordinance, you'll recall that we did include yes. fines as part of that ordinance, uh, and then also the fines under the Vacant Building Ordinance have also been increased. Do, are they significant? Um, the requirements that we have in the Historic Preservation Ordinance include a scorched earth policy to a certain degree. So I would say that, yes, they are significant. Okay. Because... Yeah. Okay. It, it's really upsetting that this developer is allowing this to happen to this significant yeah. property and to our downtown neighborhood. It's just, I mean, it's kind of like, for me, it's a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. It's like no, no regard to our community. And that's not a good, healthy thing. A uh, couple more questions on that point uh, of staff. The first one being, um, in the ordinance, is there any kind of time limit or time provision for redevelopment of projects such as this that have class one designated uh, buildings on them? Is the time limit uh, above and beyond a development time limit? No, there isn't. In the uh, zoning code, there are limits. When an entitlement is granted, the applicants typically have a two-year limit to pull building permits and start construction. Uh, there is an allowance to do an extension of those entitlements in one-year increments, uh, not to exceed two one-year increments. So there is a limit, but that's the only place in the code in terms of development where it talks about the need to proceed with development. Okay. And the other question is, uh, when find the uh, levied and then collected, 
Where do those funds go? Do they go into the city general fund, or are they given back to the HSPB? <laughs> <laughs> no, they, <laughs> no they, they go to the general fund. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Well, I like the way you think. <laughs> great, maybe we should have a revisit of that. Okay, okay any, other, um, any other comments? Okay, uh, time for staff comments. Let's see, Mr. Chair, I have no comments at this time other than we will be contacting you to schedule site visits for uh, the three reports that were given to you today. Um, as the chair has mentioned, we potentially have a study session on the Racket Club and uh, you'll be contacted on site visits for that as well. So uh, again, Jackie from our office will probably be the one who contacts you to see your availability. Okay, I think it's time then uh, for no one any comments for adjournment. So if there's no additional discussion, I'll adjourn the Historic Site Preservation Board uh, to its regularly scheduled meeting on Tuesday, October the 8th at 9 a.m. in the large conference room at City Hall. Great meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thanks,